By now, cyclic groups should begin to feel like an old pair of shoes, familiar, comfortable. Um, they come from the contexts that we find really concrete and familiar, integer addition, integer addition modulo n. Um, so the question now is, is there more than meets the eye? Are cyclic groups really as nice as we imagine them to be? Uh, and how can they help us to understand the properties of groups in the abstract? So in this video, I want to review three properties, three facts, that are true about all cyclic groups, whether we realize them in these concrete contexts or whether we realize them in abstract contexts. And I want us to begin to get used to making arguments about cyclic groups where we treat those groups abstractly rather than concretely. So let's look at three facts that cyclic groups all enjoy. The first is that every cyclic group will be abelian. So remember, not every group in the world, in fact, I would say most groups that we encounter out there in the wild, their operation does not satisfy the commutative property. Right? G operate H and H operate G are in general very different from one another. But this first of our cyclic group facts tell us that cyclic groups will never break our heart like that. Every cyclic group satisfies, its operation satisfies the commutative property. Now, I'm not going to show the formal proof here, but I want to give you an idea of why that should be true. All elements in a cyclic group are powers of a single element, called the generator. So that means that any g and h that I pick up out of my group are going to be a to some power. So maybe g is a to the n, h is a to the m. So the question is, what happens when I operate g operate h, multiply them together? Well, all I'm doing there is I'm multiplying together a, a string of, of a's, with another string of the same a's. So if I have n of them first, and then I have another set of m of them afterwards, then how many do I have in total? I have n plus m. Remember how I said in the introductory video that we see shades of the additive group of integers everywhere we look when we're dealing with cyclic groups. And this is an example. When I multiply two elements of a cyclic group together, what happens to their exponents? Their exponents just end up adding together. So this is another reflection of this idea that the integers that are in the exponents are really what's driving the structure in a cyclic group. When the group is infinite, it's the additive group, the infinite additive group of integers. And when the group is finite, then the arithmetic that happens to those exponents ends up being arithmetic of additive equivalence classes modulo n. But that's all that there is to it. The exponents are completely driving the car in a cyclic group. So that's the first fact is that any time we're dealing with cyclic groups, we know that we can take the commutative property for granted. Every cyclic group is abelian. The converse is not necessarily true, as you should convince yourself. There exist examples of abelian groups that are not cyclic. Um, we've already seen one or two this semester, even if we haven't specifically drawn attention to it yet. Fact number two is something we also hinted at in our earlier videos, is that if G is a cyclic group, then the order of the group is the same as the order of its generator. So if G is a cyclic group generated by A, and if that order is finite, so I'm making this stipulation here, if that order is finite, then the order of the group and the order of the generator are the same number. So it takes exactly as many powers of A to make the identity for the first time as there are elements in the group G. Which in the beginning feels like a very obvious fact, but when you sit down to try to prove it, um, there's a little bit more to say. For example, suppose that my group has finite order, so the order of g is n, and that's a finite number. Well, then we know for sure that the order of the generator a has to be finite, because its powers generate all the elements of g, but there are only finitely many elements of g. Right? And so no more than n of the powers of a can be distinct from one another, because they're all elements of g, which has finite order. But then that means that there must be at least two powers of a that are equal to one another, two distinct powers of a that are equal to one another. Let's call them a to the power i, a to the power j. So if the ith power of a and the jth power of a are the same as one another, what does that tell me about i and j? Well, it tells me, first of all, that if I multiply both sides by a to the minus j here, then I'm going to find out that the i minus jth power of a is the identity element. So this means that there exists uh, some power of my generator that turns that generator back into the identity. That means that A must have finite order. I've assumed here that I is different from J, which I probably should have written, so forgive me for adding that here at the last second. I different from J. 
that way. I know that this is a, a non-zero power of the, of the generator. It gives me back the identity. So the order of A is no more than the difference between this I and this J. Furthermore, we can also show that for all the I's and J's that are different from one another between 0 and N, so that are uh, starting from 0 and going up to N minus 1, all those powers of A are distinct one from another. We can't get equality uh, uh, for those low numbers of powers. So the first power is different from the second power, is different from the third power, all the way up to is different from the n minus first power, but then the nth power, which it's also different from, comes back around to the identity again. So that's that clock model we were talking about, the addition mod n uh, model for a finite group uh, that is cyclic. And for that reason, we can conclude that the order of a is actually equal to n. There's some details that I didn't fill in here, but I wanted to give you the idea for an argument that we could make for why the order of a generator in a cyclic group is equal to the order of the group. Now for the third fact, and this is where we really get off to the races thinking about what are the orders of other elements in a cyclic group. And this fact says that if G is a cyclic group, then the order of any element in that group has to be a divisor of the order of the group. Another way to say that is that the order of the group G is a multiple of the order of any of its elements. So in our first video, we asked, is it possible for a group of order 20 to have a cyclic group of order 20 to have an element of order 15? And if this fact is true, we would have to conclude no, because the order of any element within a cyclic group of order 20 has to be a divisor of 20. So 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, and 20 are all fair game, but 6 and 15 and 11 are not. So this actually is a really powerful fact. It really tightly constrains what order the elements inside of a cyclic group, a finite cyclic group, can have. And because this is so significant, let's endeavor to write a proof of this fact. Again, first assuming that the order of my group is finite. Otherwise, there's not a whole lot to say here, because what are the divisors of infinity? So if G is a finite group of order n, then let me pick up an element of the group G. And I want to show that the order of G has to divide n. Why is that true? Well, by definition of a cyclic group, we know that this element g must be some power of the generator a. So there exists an integer such that g is a raised to that integer power. It's called the integer k. So g is equal to a to the k. Now, how do we know, first of all, that the order of g has to be finite? We can make the same argument that we made right here. Right? The order of g has to be finite because otherwise, all of its powers being distinct would imply that this group were infinite. So G has to have finite order. So let's call the order of G M. So now we're down to proving that M divides N. This is what we really need to show now. And if the order of G is M, that means G to the Mth power gives me the identity element. But now we know two things about G. We know that its Mth power is the identity, and we know that G is the Kth power of the generator A. So let's smush those two things that we know together. We know that the generator A has the order equal to the order of the group. Right? So the order of A is n. That's the, what we argued for up here. It was our fact number two. And so therefore, this identity element is equal to the nth power of A. But on the other hand, G is equal itself to the kth power of A. And so the mth power of G is the mth power of the kth power of a. And by properties of exponents, again, here's the arithmetic of integers rearing its ugly head. Right? Um, when I write k powers of a m consecutive times, then in total, I have k plus k plus k plus k m times powers of a. So I have a to the k times m. But now if I read this expression from the left side to the right side, the exponents on my a's are the same. The k times mth exponent of a is equal to the nth power of a, and therefore k times m has to be equal to n. And since k, m, and n are all integers, this shows that m is a divisor of n, and that k is a divisor of n. Uh, actually, it was m that was at issue here. Sorry, that's a typo. But that is exactly what we were trying to prove. The order of G has to be a divisor of the order of the group. And that completes the proof. So, so far we've gotten quite a bit. 
Every cyclic group is abelian. The order of its generator is the same as the order of the group. And the order of any element has to be a divisor of the order of the group. These are things that all cyclic groups enjoy. So in our next video, we want to take that next step and figure out what does that tell me about the subgroups inside of a cyclic group.